Uh, greetings. My name is Vic Losick and I'm an alcoholic. Today I am moderating a discussion between two friends who, however friendly, have a disparate views of secular AA and its relationship to AA as a whole. First, we will hear from John Huey. He is a longtime former member of conventional AA, who is a founding member of the Washington DC secular meeting, We Agnostics, that started in September, 1988. And he has been active there continuously since that time. You may know him from his frequent writings on this and other related sector recovery topics. John no longer attends conventional AA meetings and believes that secular AA should disasso dissociate itself, uh, or should that be disassociate? Anyway, itself from AA itself. You can find his podcast reviews and articles at the secular recovery tab on his website, john uehuey.com. -E Next, uh, John Stewart will speak. John was an enthusiastic advocate for 12-step recovery for many years, but no longer attends AA or considers himself a member, although he still has many friends in the fellowship. John is widely published, is a widely published academic whose research covers, among other things, the influence of religion on popular culture. John believes that AA, secular AA, should stay in AA. John Huey will speak first for approximately 15 minutes, followed by John Stewart. Each will then rebut the other for five to 10 minutes. We will then take questions from all Zoom attendees for an additional 20 minutes. And if you wanna ask a question, please uh, uh, raise your hand in the participants uh, window. Mr. Yui, please. Oh, mister. I've got the timer on Vic, so you don't have to freak out, okay? It's uh, running. I got my own timer, thanks. Okay, all right. Uh, yeah, my name's John Huey, and I've been attending uh, these recovery meetings for a long, long time. I've been around since 1987, and as Vic mentioned, been a part of a secular recovery group since 1988. But I do want to make a bit of a disclaimer because uh, many of you may know me, many of you may not. I only represent myself. I do not represent any group do not represent my home group in DC, do not represent secular AA or any other alternative approach regarding secular recovery that may have popped up on the internet. I'm just an individual, just another member who's been around a long time who has a lot of opinions, as some of you may know. Uh, the, the background that I bring to this is a little different than many people who I've encountered in secular AA. I never had a crisis of the spirit. I'm coming up on my 72nd birthday next week. And at age 12, uh, one Sunday morning when my mother said it was time for church, I said no, all right? And uh, she was uh, a member of that late great species known as liberal Republican. She was a feminist Republican, which these days is a contradiction in terms. But uh, she was a wonderful person. And uh, she said, okay. And uh, I haven't had a moment of doubt about my atheism since then. Okay, that's uh, 60 years ago. So I guess I either lack self-reflection or came to some sound conclusions very early. You guys can make up your own minds about that. Um, and likewise, uh, when I began my drinking career, I never knew which lasted from age 15 to age 38. I never knew that I would end up washing up, basically psychologically washed up in something called Alcoholics Anonymous when I was 38 years old. Now, I was very fortunate, unlike some of you, I was very fortunate to wash up in AA in Northwest Washington, DC, which they would say these days is a bastion of socialism and liberalism. And the AA meetings that were current that I went to near my office in Northwest DC were of the very liberal variety. So I was not confronted with hayseed Christians 
from the very first days that I was in the program. So from that point of view, I was very lucky. But I was also told, uh, I, and also I was, uh, I'd done a lot of drinking around DC. So I knew a number of people that were already in AA before me. So I ran into old friends and associates. Uh, but uh, even though they pretty much left me alone and let me go my own way as far as my own philosophical background went, it was strongly implied from time to time that sooner or later, they all knew I would get it, okay? Well, guess what? I never got it. I never appreciated their 12 steps, except for the idea of abstinence embodied in step one. I never bought into any of their stuff about personal reformation or uh, gazing into the inner soul and getting on my knees for confession or any of that other stuff. What I did buy into and, did, and what did save my life was the following simple proposition that A, I had made a decision about my alcoholism. That B, I had decided to aggregate with other alcoholics and attend meetings where other alcoholics were present. And that then I was going to learn how to share my experience, which is how I learned about alcoholism from others. The only thing I know about alcoholism, I learned from people telling their stories in those meetings, which had an immense benefit for me because I could compare the stories that they told me about before to the present day reality of their uh, appearance that I saw before me. And I became convinced that, you know, long-term abstinence, which was the next thing I learned about, could greatly benefit me and change my life for the better. And then, <coughs> excuse me, after it was suggested that I um, uh, try to be of assistance to other people, I found that when I did things like go down to the old, you know, community for creative nonviolence mission at second and D and take a meeting down there or go out to the old DC general hospital detox or talk to people on the street or meet my friends for coffee afterwards, that I would derive a, immense benefit from trying to be of assistance to others. So all of the other stuff, I categorically rejected. And one day in 1987, and uh, I, I, I knew for a fact that I had to kind of stick with it. But by the time I got to the summer of 1988, I was on my way out the door and was ready to take another drink. And, and that was because I sat and I actually saw people chanting how it works in a meeting I went to once. And I said to myself, I can't be associated with people that chant how it works, would or could if he were sought, which some of you may have heard from time to time. So it was just very fortuitous that our meeting started, our meeting that's still ongoing here, now online, soon to be back, hopefully back at the Hill Center, um, uh, was, was formed. And I was at that first meeting and I truly believe that secular meetings saved me. That's why I take this all very seriously. Now, I was locked in a bubble here. God, the time is running, so I've got to rush. Um, I was locked in a bubble here for many years. I went to a conventional meeting at noon, which some of you probably would have sort of thought was a secular meeting because of the intellectual level of the people in the room and the lack of God consciousness constantly being uh, propounded. Um, and then, of course, I went to my 
uh, went to my Sunday meeting, uh, which, as I said, is still ongoing. Uh, and I walked to, walked the, around the world. I traveled a lot. I went around the world. I did a lot of things. I was gone a lot. I lived overseas. All kinds of things happened. But my sobriety was generally rock solid based on, you know, when I was in town going to this meeting at noon and being uh, at this meeting on Sunday. In 2014, my world got shaken because I went to the first international convention of secular AA in Santa Monica. And I was standing around with a courtyard in the courtyard with a friend of mine from DC looking around. And I said, geez, you know, this is really incredible. Uh, but I really haven't done anything for AA as a whole in many, many years. And then I looked around at the contradictions that were present there. I won't go into it, but we had a reverend presenting at the meeting. And I said, what's up with this? I said, there are contradictions within the footprint of this, which the time running the way it is, I won't go into. But there were contradictions. And little by little, I came to the conclusion, the unalterable conclusion, that I was a hypocrite, that I was going, still going to these conventional meetings where people professed a belief in something and a set of things that I had absolutely no belief in myself. So I had, I had a first class problem that was forming within my own practice of doing this. So in, 19, in, in 2017, I just stopped going to conventional AA. And I also came to the conclusion that many people within the envelope of secular recovery or secular AA or whatever we call it, that many people within the, within the footprint of that were more spending more time talking about what's going on with the 12 steps, with AA of New York City, with whatever AA recovery book was current, and that it was just logically insupportable for an atheist to do that, which is when I started talking about the eventual possibility of a true secular fellowship of secular alcoholics who had nothing to do with religion. And, you know, parenthetically, I do not believe that AA is spiritual. I believe that it's a religious organization, a religious fellowship, which is something I can't be associated with in any way. So where does that leave me? That leaves me in, I believe, probably a minority position saying that the secular fellowship should evolve and disaffiliate from conventional AA. But I'm also of a mind that there's no way that individual groups or individual people should be uh, prohibited from or even told not to affiliate any way they want to within the context of a secular fellowship. And I tried to make this clear in a couple of other talks, in a couple of other places, mostly uh, things that are on beyond belief. And given the scope of this and the very limited time um, involved here, um, I can't really make a cogent argument about these things. But if anybody's interested, there are a few podcasts I've done with our uh, wonderful host here, uh, John. Uh, it's uh, 156 is on deprogramming yourself from this foolishness. Uh, 136 is a talk that I gave on the steps in Toronto in uh, uh, a couple of years back in 2018. 
And 114 is a detailed explanation about why and how I think we should leave this AA thing as an organization behind. So uh, we can maybe have time for discussion later, um, but you know, for for right now, I'll just leave you with a with a last thought. If you are a truly secular person, do you really think that the twelve steps, as written in 1939, are anything but first century? millennial Christianity written under the influence of the Oxford group. Could they or would they be anything other than what they were intended to be when they were written? And if that is true, how could you or anyone as an atheist, I'm not talking about theists, agnostics, I don't knows or whatever. I'm talking about atheists. How could you as a avowed atheist incorporate a manner of living or a manner of thinking that is completely dominated by first century millennial Christianity of the most fundamental kind? So at that, I think I'll I'll just sort of, you know, drop the bomb, okay? I, yeah, I dropped the bomb, you know? Uh, let's get rid of this stuff and do something else that involves recovery, something that involves abstinence. I'll, I'll, just, I'll just leave that last thought and turn it over to the good professor from the United Kingdom, Dr. John Stewart. Dr. John. Hey everyone, thank you for it. Um, Vic, did you want to say anything or? No, no, go right ahead, yeah. thanks. Okay, thank you very much, John. And thank you very much, uh, John S, for putting all this together. Incredibly stressful organizing any kind of convention. So thank you very much. And uh, uh, thank you, Vic, for for uh, helping us kind of like make, make sense of this, hopefully. I've got a few pages of scattered notes. I'm gonna try and smash through them. Um, my, uh, I'm a doctor, but I'm not a proper doctor. As my mom said, uh, when I, was, I overheard her explaining on the phone to a friend that I got my PhD, uh, I heard, I overheard her say, he's not the kind of doctor that helps people have a humanities PhD, but I study the role of religion. And uh, that's one of the things I do anyway. And I teach a master's degree in popular music at BIM Institute in Brighton, if anyone's interested in that. And I've got a book coming out next year called Dylan, Lennon, Marx and God. If it passes the final stage of Cambridge University Press's internal uh, peer review system, God willing. So uh, AA and splits. I was thinking a bit about splits. America was born from a split revolutionary war. Went quite well for you, less so for us. Uh, they don't always work out. The Confederate States of America, that split wasn't a good idea. AA was born from a split from the Oxford group. I think that turned out to be a good idea, especially when you think about what happened to the Oxford group after that. Other AA splits less so. Few people remember AAA, which is the people who left AA quite early on, I think because of Bill's womanizing. Um, I could be wrong on that. Uh, there's been lots of fragmentary groups formed over the past 20 years. Stanton Peel's got one. There's a Tempest Sobriety School the Cyber Sundays, moderation management, they're all tiny and you only ever hear of them when something goes wrong, such as the tragedy that happened with the founder of moderation management. Is it time to split now? No, it's not. Uh, you'd be another one of those. There are much bigger things at stake. And what I would argue is get closer, especially with the people that you disagree with. My context is that of someone who no longer attends any fellowship, haven't done for the last eight years. And I'm 20 years, uh, sober i guess you call it um lots of people do leave uh and uh i personally um i left because of because of the religious stuff because of what what john was saying about that that schism i had horrendous and some other personal stuff if i'm truthful but a lot a lot of it was the religious stuff when i joined i was an avowed atheist i was a seven on the 
Richard Dawkins scale, if you know what that is, probably even seven and a half. And um, I had old school sponsorship, Clancy and Chuck, Chuck D style, Chuck C style. Chuck D's a rapper, isn't he? Uh, and had a spiritual experience as a result of working the steps and uh, found very strong faith, became a very strong 12 stepper. Uh, saved my life and many others I sponsored and I came to America and I went to all the sites this is my I had to have a piece of floorboard from Bill's house at 182 Clinton Street they were scrapping the inside of the house they didn't know what it was I said can I take this out of the skip and it's this is the floorboard Bill Wilson knelt on to pray Mm -hmm. in his early days Um, although it turns out I did bring a load of woodworm back to the UK with it which was uh, not such a good idea and um, my kind of position is, you know what, you're better on your knees in church than you are on your back in the gutter. Um, I lost my faith as part of step 11, funnily enough, um, because uh, as part of step 11, I thought I'll get closer to Jesus. And um, I read Bart Ehrman's book, The Historical Jesus, which uh which is a fantastic exposition of who Christ probably was based on what we can reliably work out, he said, in the Gospels, which are things, you know, he has a fairly solid system for looking at it and working it out, things he might have said in more than one Gospel that perhaps weren't written together, things he might have said that might be self-defeating. And um, uh, and I finished that course and I thought, so Jesus isn't the person that the religious people think he is. Okay. And um, and then I clicked on a YouTube video by uh, Professor Andy Thompson on evolutionary psychology and faith. And um, I opened that video as a person of faith with doubts, and I closed it 40 minutes later as a confirmed atheist again absolutely 100% confirmed atheist. It's the most powerful explanatory mechanism for faith I've ever seen. In fact, I have friends in the fellowship today. I have religious friends that I don't tell them about that. If I'm in an argument with somebody and I I kind of want to challenge them because I feel they're being didactic about it or whatever, I'll ask them to watch it. But people who I think their faith is important to them as mine was, I, I don't, I don't, it's very, very powerful. And it's also a book. And uh, if you search Andy Thompson, Why We Believe in Gods, it'll take you straight there. So I wanted to just mention a little bit about evolutionary psychology, because it's kind of one of the things that's come up since that book was written. Um, And it tells us a lot about how things like AA work through phenomena like in-group thinking. Um, There are two famous experiments on that. Uh, one is the ash conformity experiment which put very simply uh, if you draw three different length lines on a wall and everybody in the room says uh, the middle one is the longest one you'll knowingly say that the same because you want to agree with them Um, it's a very well established truth that we'd rather agree with the people around us than we would stand out and say something different and like a lot of weird things about AA and religion, it's a positive thing. That's a positive thing in your life. If you're dying of alcoholism and everybody in the room is saying, you can get, you don't have to drink today and you don't think you can, but you you say that, that's a good first step on the road to recovery. Uh, and uh, it's Andy Thompson, uh, David, uh, Professor Andy Thompson, J, J, J Anderson Thompson is his full name. Um, so the I started thinking about how AA works psychologically, having been to a lot of meetings over the years, obviously the first 12 years of, of that and having been really involved in it. Um, and there's other, there are other elements of evolutionary psychology that are really fascinating to think about. One is our, our need for authority figures, um, which in contemporary terms, the Milgram experiment, which probably many of you may have heard of, which is where somebody, six out of 10 people will electrocute somebody to death if told to do so by somebody in a white coat because they, they, they look like a scientist. And that's been uh, done over and over in all kinds of different circumstances. And even today, uh, it still equates to roughly six out of 10. And essentially what Milgram was trying to show was, was, was that um, 
you know, he was trying to explain how something like the Holocaust could happen. So given that uh, our need for in-group thinking is kind of in us, apostasy isn't easy. That's my experience. It's not easy. Uh, we don't like it. And we, if we go into a room and we're not part of that group, others are suspicious of us quite naturally. And it helped me a lot to understand that. And it also helped me to explain evolutionary psychology in particular, the biology of alcoholism. There's a fantastic book by Robert Dudley called The Drunken Monkey. It came out in about 2011. It's been largely ignored. Uh, he's an evolutionary psychologist who's trying to explain why his father died of alcoholism. And um, the basic thesis is the relationship between uh, need for energy in food, which was very rare. Uh, the fact that fruit has sugar in it, yeast settles on fruit, turns the sugar to alcohol. We all know the process. It keeps the fruit ripe for another 24 hours in the jungle. Um, and as developed mammals, we have a very, very sensitive uh, response to alcoholism. We have mass to alcohol. We have massive drivers for that chemical. Now, I can go in an AA meeting and I can explain alcoholism to them based on the drunken monkey thesis, but it's not going to do anything. It doesn't It's not AA. And I do think this part of the argument why secular AA should stay in AA is that you're in a position to do that as people who have a, an outside opinion, but who are still in the group. Uh, if you're interested in the idea, uh, the National Geographic did a cover episode, uh, issue, I think 2018. It's called Our Love Affair with Booze, and you can find it online. And I would recommend any alcoholic reader. It's a superb story story of the history of alcohol and culture goes all the way back to uh, early evolution and then it also explains things like guilt and shame you know if you imagine if you imagine we're a group of physically quite weak but mentally quite intelligent early hominins trying to capture a large mammoth and kill it collectively we have to act collectively to do that um, and don't believe all this stuff that environmentalists tell you about early humans being at one with nature. Uh, we very quickly hunted all the large uh, animals to extinction, including mammoths and horses in North America, which is why Native Americans didn't have horses. Um, you know, and if you're hanging back, uh, the people in the hunt are going to point at you and go, get up here, mate. We've got a mammoth to kill. We all need to be in a line waving our fiery sticks at it. And they will shame you. And you will feel guilt. And there's an evolutionary reason for that. Yeah, thank you, Patrick. So um, I kind of understood how groups work. And I think groups work really well. And I think groups work big as well for a problem like alcoholism. And AA is a big group. Uh, so first of all, secular AA is in a, position, a unique position within that group to explore new ideas because you're the radicals, right? And uh, everybody hates you anyway. You just don't believe in God. But also, AA exists as a very strong group. Um, everybody knows AA. So if you do leave it, you'd be leaving this organization that is the world's best known organization to help alcoholics. If you do disassociate from it, you disassociate from all the good that that brings. And when you think about it, I probably differ with, with John on this, but I actually think the AA program works. It has a... Um, it's a separate debate, really, but it has a strong, strongly aligned with the DSA definition of alcoholism. It's different words, but it's saying the same thing. Program of action, I've done some CBT. It's very similar to, to how CBT and contemporary therapy works in many ways. Um, and there are some details that are different, like the black and white thinking of AA. And um, But if you think about all the good things that have come along to help alcoholics since then, um, smart which is tbt based life ring which you sort of design your own program the sinclair method where you can keep drinking and medicate on it um none of those has become very big and they haven't become very big because everybody knows aa works the sinclair method has a i think i don't know for sure but i believe statistically the sinclair method has a better recovery rate than alcoholics anonymous does for whatever that's worth and whether, whether or not that's true, I can't be certain. But certainly some early early studies suggest that. Um, and it's and the interesting thing about that is that you take a pill and you can um, you can apparently moderate. I'm abstinent, so I wouldn't know and I don't care. But I know I've seen people it's worked for. And Bill Wilson famously wrote, "We need a methadone for alcoholics" in 1970 or just before he died, which is essentially kind of what that is. So. 
uh, I think secular AA is in a unique position to engage with mainstream AA, not just on the issue of God, but on all the the kind of liminal issues around alcoholism, how we help people get sober, um, and in a, in a in an era when the internet's around, we can communicate like this internationally, uh, uh, thousands of miles apart. Um, I think it, it's really worth exploring. And I also think as a 100% atheist, that really that invites us to consider what, what, what it means, uh, what religion really means in society, because I might not believe in God, but that doesn't mean there isn't a social utility to religion. And religion is essentially, uh, there isn't a God, religion's not true, but it's our way of acting collectively without hitting each other. And that's essentially this evolutionary purpose. And it's still in there. And, um, you know, we might not like it, but it's a human right for people to have faith. So I feel we should get on with them. And this is in the grand tradition philosophically of the United States. You know, American philosophically is American pragmat pragmatism. It's not this, it's William James. It's like, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, which is what AA is. Get it done. It's not some European philosophy where you're sort of sitting around going is it even a chair i don't know what is a chair that's not how aa works that's not how the united states work just get it done american pragmatism's grand tradition is accept religion work with it uh don't kick against it and it's inevitable that a, a group like aa would have been founded within religion and that will be a strong part of it especially when you think about all the religions that religious movements that have been founded in the west you know even since the enlightenment i think we're lucky that aa was founded on a tradition that is a liberal tradition a liberal enlightenment based tradition religiously so you know uh, i think it's time to take advantage of that and, and and help it work so that people can still stay in aa let people come to aa let people get religion let them get sober let them lose a religion and join secular aa let people join secular aa get religion and join mainstream AA. I don't care as long as people are well. Um, I think we have to accept people have agency, and if that agency includes faith, then that's their decision. Um, I think the traditions of AA are extremely strong, and I guess ultimately uh, I wouldn't want to throw out the baby with the bathwater in that respect because I think that's why AA survived. Um, and it's not; it's very unusual to have an organisation that lasts for so long without a, a fatal schism. And I guess ultimately, I suppose I'd sum up what I'm trying to say, um, that I, I think the world is changing. As we know, if you look at the num membership numbers and the average age of the AA member, it's quite old. So I actually think that you need AA and I think AA needs you every bit as much as you need AA. So I would actually try and get closer. And um, I love John very much. He's a, he's a wonderful guy. So I, one thing I learned in AA was to, you can disagree, but you, you don't have to be disagreeable. And we do disagree on many other things. This is just one of them. Uh, but like all my best friends, I don't, I, I have most of my friends think I'm wrong on most of the things I say. So I'm proud to be in that, uh, in that category with John on several issues as well. And thank you very much. So hopefully that made sense and I'm happy to sort of chat further on stuff around how all that works for for what i know i mean i'm just as john said i'm just another guy talking shit on the internet who knows so thank you that's right thank you, john. I'll, I'll, I'll i'll just stick one stick in your eye john i love 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 red tony ben and i <laughs> wish he was still alive so if anybody I am one of red tony's guys okay for those of any... you that don't know you don't have to bother with it but he knows uh, no, but to, to get back to this AA stuff, uh, of course, AA works, okay? I have some dear friends of mine I met in the first weeks I was around in 1987 that were still, I mostly I end up meeting them at funerals these days. That's how long I've been around. But, uh, you know, unfortunately, that's the fact that people you attended uh, early with uh, tend to pass on. But, uh, you know, uh, without a doubt, uh, my friend who's a deacon in the Episcopal Church, it works like a charm for him, as it's written in the book. 
I have no problem with that, okay? He's a wonderful man, but we're very close friends and he knows that I think he's totally deluded, right? And I'm not gonna tell people that they're not deluded when they clearly are. And, you know, the, uh, the statistic, statistics you can bend any which way. I'll just come up with a little, uh, you know, some anecdotal statistics of my own. When we first started our meeting in September of 1988, there were probably something like 20 secular meetings in the United States. There was Charlie Pulitzer's meeting in California, the, the, the Quad A groups, uh, you, know, the, uh, you know, those socialist atheists up in New York City, uh, you know, and, and a couple of others around the country, right? Uh, by the time uh, the conference uh, came about, in 2014, there were probably something like 150 of those groups in 2014. Now, the person that was doing the counting is doing something else these days, I think. I don't know quite what. But um, the, uh, uh, the best estimate we could have now is that it's around 600 and growing. So, my position has been that now, unlike 2014, now, today, it's all about the internet. You know, I'm looking for somebody, I wish I had gotten rich in my business in Russia, but I didn't. I would have founded it myself, I would fund it myself. But I'm looking for somebody really, really rich who's an atheist. If anybody knows a really, really rich atheist, hook me up because we need to invest real money in the internet in doing this right and letting these poor suffering people in Texas, Oklahoma, backwoods of Arkansas, rural conditions everywhere and even urban people that don't know that there's another way, they need to know at every stroke of the keypad that there's another way. And this infrastructure is growing large enough so that we don't have to suffer. Read Beyond Belief for a month and look at how, read the, the, uh, the, the, the closed Facebook pages on Beyond Belief. And I know Mr. Sheldon knows this to be true. Those closed Facebook pages are filled with suffering and that suffering relates to people dealing with these crazies in conventional meetings and thinking that they have to put up with it. I'm sitting here an old man now and I haven't put up with it for one fucking second. Not a second, not in all these years. And I sit there reading those posts and looking at this unnecessary suffering and it drives me crazy. We suffer at the hands of these people, just like the citizens of the United States have suffered these last four years. We suffer at the hands of these people. And why we put up with it, I do not know. And just to be, I feel like I'm a, sometimes I feel like I'm like the, the atheist going to a meeting in Texas somewhere when I come to these meetings here, because I, you know, I feel like I've got another way of doing it and I've got to try to convince people that it's so, okay? That what I'm saying is valid, that you don't have to put up with these people and their condescension and their ability to make you feel less of a person than you are, to make you feel guilt, to make you feel shame, to make you feel that you have character defects. Fuck them, okay? What, what, how about that, John? Well, I, I have to say, I do think that uh, AA needs uh, firebrands. And um, I, I, I definitely um, 
you know, I identify with everything you, you said. In fact, um, one of the reasons why I don't go to AA anymore is is the issue of character defects, which I don't believe are character defects. I believe they're at one time evolutionary advantages that are maladapted to uh, our current lifestyle. It was the it was the the chimp who fought for the rotten fruit uh, that whose offspring survived the winter, and that's why that's why we behave the way we behave. Um, so, uh, and you know, I, I, I identify strongly with, uh, the, the sense of frustration. Um, one of the things I did quite early on when I rediscovered my atheism, right or wrong, um, I wrote about it. Um, I was very angry at the fellowship. I, um, I broke tradition 11, I think it is quite substantially because I didn't want to go back. And I did an interview with the guy called The Thinking Atheist, Seth, whatever his name is. And in, through doing that, I learned why anonymity at the level of press, radio and film is actually important. And I do think it was a mistake now. But um, um, I did an interview with Seth and I was so angry. I, 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 but I, I It was only going to be a half hour one. It's a big atheist podcast in America. And I, I found myself crying with frustration about halfway through, like I needed help and I got religion. How did that work? You know, so I do identify with that. And I know that religiosity and abstinence are the, the main two reasons people don't make it. And I get a lot of, um, uh, I get a lot of lie. I get, so I have a little blog, uh, johnsleeper.wordpress.com. And the, most of the emails that come to me from people in a sort of religious situation, trapped in AA, come from the Midwest, those 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 uh those states and um people in small towns with where there's few meetings and they're all very religious and i just say start an atheist meeting you know or, or maybe not i don't know some parts of america that's a difficult thing to do isn't it you could lose your job so well yeah I, I went out to the conference in arizona the one before last and uh they had virtually nothing in the state of arizona between, uh, you know, in 2014, when I first met folks from Arizona, and now they have maybe the most dynamic uh, sec group, secular groups in, in, the, in the West mm -hmm. that I'm aware of. And that happened virtually overnight. So, I think and it's not, you know, Arizona is not New York City. All right. So Don't that part, part, part of... Sorry, go on, Vic. I'm sorry. I, I just want to, there's uh, roughly 15 minutes left, and I want to mm. leave some time for some questions, um, unless there's something burning, you have a burning uh, desire or something. I well, I guess the, the only thing I was going to say was that I think secular AA is growing very rapidly, and the more every time mainstream AA has tried to squash it, it's only caused it to grow more. So I, I do actually think secular AA is probably the best positioned organization to help those peoples in small town America via AA that will be that will be sort of how I would close it out but my other thing is just dialogue I think dialogue is important I'll talk to anybody I don't care who it is and I'm just really happy that this discussion's happening and um you know hopefully it's it's been an interesting one fair enough oh uh, yeah so, I just want to say to to anyone of the 105 people there if you have a question you'd like to ask either John uh, please put it uh in the chat room and I'll try and read it in the meantime I'll take a little personal privilege and ask uh, a question to each. Mr. Yui, what you say you would like secular AA to disassociate itself or dissociate itself, I looked it up there, they're interchangeable, uh, from uh, conventional traditional AA, what practical steps do you uh, have in mind? Okay, well, the only practical step that is possible given our current organizational structure is to debate it at our next real convention and get a sense of the uh, convention on that, away, given the way the current structure works. So that's gonna be the last weekend in October, 2021. Please do not come unless you are vaccinated. I'll just say that as a personal thing. But as long as you've got the proper shots in your arm, please come and, uh, and, and we'll, we'll hash it out the way we do everything else. 
I suspect it's going to take longer than I'm going to be around to debate it. I'm not uh, optimistic enough that the conservative elements in this organization, which are quite strong, will be open enough to formally disassociating from that broken down moribund uh, organization and uh, go our own way. Now, having said that, my own vision of this would be that any individual group or any individual can be a, a member of more than one organization. You can, well, you know, sure. you can carry pictures of Bill Wilson around if you want. I don't care. John, there's a slightly political response on your part. I, I mean, uh, well, what exactly did, there are, let's say there are 500 or 600 secular AA meetings around the world. What should they do? If let's say they, at, at the next meeting, everyone votes, oh yeah, we're gonna leave they should, AA. So they should encourage as much as possible starting more of those meetings. But, and but they should, should they drop they should the, from their on the internet and, and, and promote the idea of a secular recovery. Well, I think secular A claims that right now as we speak. Well, <laughs> here, here's one last thought that I didn't incorporate in my talk, which if I'd done a good job like John, John Stewart did and written the notes up, I would have probably put in. I think we've already left. I think we're not part of them at all anyway, because as soon as we say, we're not religious, we're really not part of them. So it's not a big step to take the rational step, which is to say no, but also to say, you know, we're not in the, I, I lived in Moscow for a while back in the mid 2000s and had a lot of stuff to do over there. And there was a cathedral there called Christ the Savior Cathedral. It's a brand new thing built by Putin. Its predecessor in 1932 had been blown up by the Bolsheviks. I actually used it as a backdrop for one of my old articles about, uh, about this. And you know, it became obvious to me that being anti-religion per se is a political position and a human position that does not work. So I'm not going to blow up anybody's church. I have no desire to do that. Okay. If well, you, you want your AA church, by all means, have it. I have no innings. I'm not a Bolshevik. Okay. okay. Let me let, let me move move on if you don't mind. So and, and you kind of preempted my my question to John Stewart. Uh, first of all, John Stewart, you you did sort of slur over the fact that you were uh, a Clancy acolyte. Um, Massive. Yeah. Uh, in the day. Uh, so that, that might give it a whole new shading to what you had to say. Anyway, um, uh, this is what exactly what uh, John Huey said. Isn't secular AA right now a split, a sect, a schism from regular AA? Um, no, I think it's a part of it. I mean, there is already a secular, secular organization for sobriety. It's called Secular Organizations for Sobriety, and it's <laughs> tiny. And that's what you'd be if you leave AA. So... Um, I think AA is a fantastic route in for people, but very few people on this meeting, I would imagine, or maybe you have, because because maybe you you've tried to seek it out alongside AA. But very SOS is tiny, and it already exists. So so the if you're a genuine atheist, um, go find an SOS meeting. Uh, I couldn't find one. That's why I joined AA. And then if the if there had been more vocal secular AA, I probably would have stayed in. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, John Christopher, the founder of SOS, yeah. he used to come to our meeting in D.C. regularly. He was lobbying in D.C. regularly. He tried to recruit me in 1990. And when I saw that the structure of it did not involve honest sharing and the kind of fellowship that we had in our already strong secular meeting, I didn't want to have anything to do with it. Mm. He recently passed away, as a matter of fact. And I, I thought about those numerous encounters I had with him. He made mighty efforts to recruit me, and I always told him no. 
but I, I also think that the other part of the equation is, uh, you know, you mentioned, John, that you don't think you don't think it will happen. I don't think it will happen in my lifetime either. But the demographics are on the side of uh, secular AA. And uh, uh, I think that in in the lifetime of younger people on the call, this secular AA will become a bigger part of AA. It will maybe at one point become big enough to split away in the way that AA perhaps did from the Oxford group. Although I, I guess AA wasn't very big when that happened. So that's not really an argument for me. Yeah. But yeah. Um, yeah. I just think oh. that, that they will live together and they will do better together. Um, be, and I think AA, secular AA will grow because let's face it, there isn't a God and all sp- ideas of spirituality are in your head and the God of the gops, gaps is shrinking away to nothing. And, you know, I used to, when I first arrived at meetings, I'd say, I, I don't, I don't believe there's a God. I think we can pretty much prove it. And we kept, since then we've done that. We had, that's what the CERN uh, part, particle accelerator, accelerator was all about. We hypothesized the God particle and we found it. So if I was to share in a meeting now, I, I couldn't share in secular AA, and I wouldn't in religious say, and, and I, I wouldn't want to, but I do still think religion has a social purpose. We have literally disproved God and religion isn't going away because something inside us needs religion, just like it needs fellowship, just like it needs sugars, just like like all, all all the all the different signifiers of how evolution works deep inside our psychology, they're not going anywhere. Even something righteous like um, extinction rebellion, all those prayers to Mother Earth that happen at extinction rebellion. I mean, that's nonsense, right? That's nonsense. And I'm in favor of the environment, but let's not sort of pretend that somehow early humans were particularly connected to it. So we have this natural religious yearning for meaning. It's an evolutionary thing. We're never going to lose it. We have to work with it. And if that means working with dogmatic religious people in AA meetings, for me, I mean, obviously I'm, I don't do either anymore, but strategically, I think that's, as an outsider, a better option. But, okay. Uh, by the way, if, if I understand you correctly, uh, John Stewart, uh, you think secular AA is a growing part of a shrinking organization? Yeah, okay. and should do that and should okay. stay there because because demographics the demographics is on your side and the science is on your side and they're they're two of the, the the biggest factors that change any culture demographics and science that's like that's how anything changes really so um i would just be patient and a generation from now we won't we won't need this discussion yes in the good old by and by right john and never yeah. say never i think you're going to be touring when you're uh keith and mick's age okay <laughs> so never, never say never. Okay, you'll be on stage when you're a geriatric. I'm certain of it. I am now, mate. No, 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 no. I know when your first album came out. Okay, I saw the cover. So there we oh, go. Okay, so here's uh, somebody else. This is from uh, Cynthia to everyone. There is nothing liberal about traditional AA. There is nothing radical about secular AA. The question is, do we try to change the system from within? Or go full out revolution. Hmm. I would. I would. Oh, but Stuart, go ahead. Well, I mean, I'd change it from within. That would be mine. And I think that will happen. I would think. I would think it happened with the issue over the representation of women in the book, and I think it's already happening over the issue with the representation of atheists in the system. I think both of those will happen. Okay. Um, okay. Here's something else from Tracy to everyone. Secular AA neither endorses nor opposes any sponsors sponsorship. Many groups are against it. It's about accessing your agency to sort yourself out using professional help and tools of your own forging and the group. I think that's in response to someone asking about uh, a sponsor sponsee where they have different beliefs. Well, I, you know, there's nothing wrong with having friends that you meet at meetings, but having someone who has opinions about your personal life is something I never tolerated. If that's what you need, you know, I guess that's what you need. But um, all of this business of getting into an individual member's perfectly legal behavior is, um, you know, it's not, it's not what I got sober to do. I got sober to have an independent life that is uh, within the, the lights that I devised to live it by, not the lights that you 
devised to live it by. As long as I'm not harming other people, you shouldn't have an opinion about it. And I, I, I would uh, agree with John there. I think sponsorship is one of the areas where traditional AA is vulnerable uh, to legal challenges. Uh, the, the People are surprised when I talk to them about AA that there's, there's no official safeguarding in Alcoholics Anonymous at all. And um, there certainly wasn't when I was going. And um, uh, the, that system is very vulnerable to uh, people being influenced. And um, it's something that I think could cause legal challenges in future. So I actually do think that it, there's a potential that that's one of the things that could change too. That could be, you know, if you go to Smart Recovery, uh, you won't have a sponsor, but you'll work with someone who's, who's trained but obviously, as a result of that, there are very few people who can who can do smart facilitation. They call it, I believe. Um, one, one, it stops the meetings growing. Uh, one last question. This is uh, it's from Peter T in Vermont to John H. Why is the DC We Agnostics meeting still part of AA? Why haven't they been convinced to break away? Because I have no opinion on that, and I've stayed away from all of my personal opinions in my home group, mostly, you know, when I, when I come up with a, uh, you know, I, I go, I go there for the fellowship. But why don't you advocate what you believe in? You just say, I've, I've advocated it many, many times, but I've never made it an issue because there are people in that group that disagree with me yeah. who are friends of mine who I don't want to have a fight with. Well, I would say that's probably in every secular AA meeting, there are going to be people that disagree. I'm not saying that any individual meeting shouldn't list both ways. I would suggest that a lot of meetings would continue their listing both ways. I'm not saying that wouldn't happen. And they're, they're, for those reasons I just outlined, and that that's perfectly okay. What I'm talking about is what we are organizationally, not what we are individually or on the group level. The group level will always, we'll have snake handlers out there that say they're secular, okay? <laughs> I mean, you know, well, well, you know, groups are groups. They'll do what they do. They'll, yeah. they'll worship crystals. Let John, let worship John ask you out there. I just want to say super quickly, because I've been reading through the chat, it's been really interesting, but and I don't want to sound massively didactic about God being disproven, right? Because clearly you can't prove a negative. So yeah, that's that's philosophically impossible to do. Okay, if anybody is interested way. in the just just two references, right? The story of the Higgs boson and the discovery of that is is really interesting. And that wasn't around when I was in the early days arguing atheism in AA meetings. And if you are interested in what, what the power of evolutionary psychology means to everything we think we know about our spiritual desires, Google Why We Believe in Gods by Andy Thompson. If you are a person of faith or if you know somebody of faith and you don't want to disrupt their life fundamentally, don't do it. It's a very, very powerful explanatory mechanism for all of our spiritual urges, Buddhist or anything. So it's a challenge, but it, 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 it's um, uh, just because Brian had mentioned that about the God thing. Obviously, you can't prove nothing. Something doesn't exist. That's the black swan <laughs> argument. But there are a couple of things that have come along since I first became around, you know, in 2000. That, that, that w w are, I would encourage anyone to look at if you're interested in the argument. It's the God of the gaps argument is shrinking smaller and smaller and smaller beyond the Higgs boson, which is like the smallest thing you could imagine, you know. So it's an interesting argument. And I'm not, I'm not saying we've proven anything. I did say that, uh, but um, uh, sorry, right. when you're writing in block capitals, that, that instantly, if you're writing block capitals, mate, that instantly undermines, that instantly uh, disproves your argument. So, but yeah, yeah I, I'm, okay. I'm always up for that kind of debate as well. It's an interesting one. Uh, John Sheldon, uh, according to my clock here, we've less than a minute left. Are you around, John? 